So, you might have heard that Yellowstone National Park is sitting on top of a giant supervolcano. That's the reason why the area can boast powerful geysers and hot springs. But it also means that underneath Yellowstone, there is an enormous magma chamber. In 2015, researchers from the University of Utah found out that this chamber was much bigger than everyone had previously thought. They even found one more reservoir with magma under the top one. Apparently, the more spacious the chambers are, the more magma they contain. Together, the two reservoirs store a glob of magma that could easily fill the Grand Canyon not once, but 11 times. But you know the most worrying thing about the magma chambers? They tend to push against the ground above them. As a result, the land in Yellowstone rises about 1 to 2 inches a year. On top of that, Yellowstone has the status of an active volcano, and its volcanic explosivity index, yes, there is one, is 8 out of 8. Such a high number means that if this volcano erupted, it would be an apocalyptic event. To put it into perspective, The eruption of Pinatubo in the Philippines in 1991, which is considered the most powerful in living memory, was given a mere 6 on the Volcanic Explosivity Index. Ha! Loser! Now, let's figure out if there's anything to worry about. In March 2023, the University of Utah seismograph stations recorded 354 earthquakes in the entire region of Yellowstone National Park. Sounds like a lot. But keep in mind that the most impressive event of the month was a mini-earthquake of magnitude 3.7. It was part of a swarm of 106 earthquakes that began on March 29th and continued until the end of the month. Yep, earthquakes apparently also come in swarms, so be aware. Experts say that Yellowstone's seismic activity is, well, kind of more active than usual. But it's really nothing serious. A geophysicist working at Yellowstone Volcano Observatory, called Michael Poland, claims that the volcano won't erupt anytime soon. For this to happen, there must be enough magma ready to erupt beneath the surface. Whew. There should also be enough pressure to cause this magma to rise. But neither of these conditions exist today. According to the expert, Yellowstone is stable now. At the same time, Poland and his team are keeping track of all kinds of underground activity, looking for warning signs of possible eruptions. Some of them can be the frequency of earthquakes and ground deformation. Thousands of mini-earthquakes, coupled with extreme changes in the surface of the ground in that area, can be alarming. The team also monitors the temperature of the park's thermal features. That's another noteworthy sign of a potential disaster park-wide changes in geyser activity, as well as gas and thermal emissions. So, despite the media claims that Yellowstone is due to erupt soon because the last eruption happened 70,000 years ago, that's not how volcanoes work. Experts say that it's one of the most popular misconceptions about volcanoes. They don't follow timelines. If a super eruption did happen, though, the most worrying thing for us would not be the lava flows and not an earthquake that would most likely accompany the natural disaster. No, the worst consequence of such a super eruption would be ash and ash fall. Let's have a look at what it was like when the Yellowstone volcano erupted many years ago. There have been at least three super eruptions in the history of the volcano. The most powerful of them was 2,500 times more devastating than the terrifying eruption of Mount St. Helens in Washington State in 1980. As for the most recent super eruption, it was dubbed the Lava Creek eruption. It formed the Yellowstone caldera after spewing out an insane amount of dust, volcanic ash, and rock into the air. Recently, scientists have also learned about two other previously unknown super eruptions that happened around 9 and 8.7 million years ago. The younger of the two is now considered to be the largest recorded event of the whole Snake River Yellowstone volcanic province. Anyway, let's have a look at what was going on all those millions of years ago. Because I wasn't around then, so we're all assuming this stuff based on evidence. The first signs of the disaster appeared long before the catastrophe broke out. 
For thousands of years, the heat had been welling up from within the planet's insides. It'd been melting rock beneath the planet's crust and leaving behind huge chambers. They were filled with a pressurized mixture of semi-solid rock, magma, water vapor, and different gases, including carbon dioxide. All this scorching underground soup was expanding since more and more magma arrived with time. The land over the volcanic system was rising upward almost unnoticeably. A year before the super eruption, Yellowstone gave a warning. A burp, maybe? But that long ago, there was no one who could interpret these signals. Plus, those alarming processes were mostly going on underground. For example, decompression releases gas bubbles. While bursting, such bubbles can often power particular kinds of eruptions. Months before the eruption, small-scale earthquakes became more frequent and more intense. The ground in many spots all over the supervolcano got hotter than it used to be. Surface lakes and groundwater also became warmer. If people had been around at that time, they would have noticed unusual steam fogging in that area. Not long before the eruption started, the growing pressure pushed the ground over the magma chamber up. This created a dome-shaped uplift. Narrow cracks started to open along the edges of this dome. Imagine opening a bottle of soda after you've shaken it. Something like that was happening near the volcano. Eh, Think Mentos and Diet Coke. The pressure was released through the fractures when gases were bursting out from under the surface. So right before the disaster, the ground around the Yellowstone volcano lifted. Geothermal pools and geysers heated up to boiling temperatures and got more acidic than usual. The magma started to rise toward the surface. At one point, the rock roof of the magma chamber couldn't resist anymore, and the eruption kicked off. Small but constant tremors began to move the ground days before the catastrophe. But the real shaking didn't start until several minutes before the eruption. With a deafening roar, a massive column of lava and ash curled up into the air. Within several minutes, a pyroclastic flow rushed across the area at a hurricane force speed. Such a flow is a liquid mixture of half-solid lava pieces, volcanic ash, and hot expanding gases. It looked like an extremely hot toxic snow avalanche. With a temperature of about 1,300 degrees, it was burning everything in its path. The volcano kept pumping ash for days on end. For all living creatures, ash fallout was one of the most dangerous consequences of the eruption. Volcanic ash turns into glassy cement within seconds of being inhaled. Most animals didn't have a chance to survive. Even thick trees started to collapse under the weight of this dense substance. It only took a couple of days until a thick layer of ash covered huge territories. After the ash got into the stratosphere, the temperatures all over the world started to drop. The eruption was rich in sulfur, which is an effective sunblocker. That's why it soon got so cold that there was no summer in the whole world for the next several years. Animals couldn't find food and clean water. This natural disaster called the Gray's Landing Super Eruption was colossal. That's how researchers described it in their recent studies. It affected a huge territory. The streams of lava enameled an area as large as New Jersey in scorching hot volcanic glass. It instantly sterilized the land surface, wiping out all the plant life that had been thriving there before. Now, if such an eruption were to happen these days, it would cover Colorado, Utah, and Wyoming with almost three feet of toxic volcanic ash. Many regions would be plunged into darkness. Even the coast, where most Americans live, would experience problems with the spread of the ash cloud. It would destroy crops and contaminate pastures, ruin power lines and electrical transformers. Well, so I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's a good thing that such a disaster isn't expected to occur anytime soon. Hey, we got enough other stuff on our plate. Ah, Kiev, you've been dreaming of getting here for years. Getting out your trusty camera, you start taking pictures of the cathedrals, aviation museum, and the Dnipro River, when, without warning, there's an enormous boom behind you. Turning around, you see something towering in the distance. 
It looks like a gigantic explosion. Uh Uh-oh, time to leave fast! In June 2020, what the people of Kiev were looking at was an anvil cloud, a rare storm formation in the sky. Forming when strong air currents carry water vapor upwards, the air expands and spreads out as it hits the bottom of the stratosphere. It pushes the dense cloud into the cool anvil shape you see, and sometimes it even gets to be a mushroom. Anvil clouds produce some of the most dangerous lightning of all storms, one that's called a bolt out of the blue. This lightning strike seems to magically come out of the blue sky with the storm being many miles away. This type of bolt comes from the top of the anvil and can be 10 times more powerful than a typical lightning strike. People got so frightened after witnessing a giant cloud just 60 miles away, thinking something terrible must have happened. The locals had pictures of the large billow on social media before officials could explain what was going on. Authorities managed to calm everyone's fears by informing them it was nothing more than a natural phenomenon, and a beautiful one at that. Before dissipating, these clouds typically stay in one area, regardless of how strong the wind is. Touring around the northern tip of Queensland, Australia, way away from those creepy crawlies, it's time to take a break and relax at the beach. Getting comfortable, you notice a great big shadow passes over you, then another, and yet another. Looking up, this weird weather is simply stunning. The clouds are called morning glory, a very rare type of cloud that almost seems to roll across the sky, looking like a massive tube. These clouds can measure up to 600 miles long, even appearing in large groups as well. This phenomenon is the result of an updraft pushing through the cloud, creating a rolling appearance, while moist cooler air at the back causes them to sink downward. Southern India, between July and September 2001. People witnessed one of the strangest weather phenomenon in recorded history. The rain was red. What many would have thought to be a typical rainstorm left them shocked. The color was bright enough to stain clothes. There were other colors too, such as green, yellow, brown, and even black. In the middle of a monsoon, red rain started to fall and did so periodically for several weeks. Researchers have found this unusual rain is stained either by dust or algae, so don't try to catch any on your tongue. Scientists aren't entirely sure how the algae got all the way up there. This does make events like this a little unsettling. Like to take a bubble bath to relax after an exhausting day, but taking too long to fill the bathtub? Problem solved! head to any coastline after a big storm and take a dip. Foamy tides aren't native to any one place or location. They can be formed anywhere in the world. They're most likely to happen along rocky coastlines, like the coast of San Francisco, Northern Ireland, or the Mooloolaba, Australia. Each coast has differing conditions forming the sea foams. If you scoop up seawater into a glass and look at it closely, you'll see it's full of tiny particles. Many things like plants, chemicals, and lots of salt and minerals create the perfect formula for foam. When powerful currents and wind mix it all together, we get something that resembles a cappuccino top floating on top of the water. When freezing temperatures hit orchards in Michigan, all kinds of unusual things happen like ghost apples. No, they're not going to scare you at all. But if you plan on sneaking away one winter to find one, be warned. Everything has to be perfect for this to occur, and it's going to be freezing cold. This is actually a rare weather phenomenon caused by having the apples freeze where they are with rain coating the fruit in a thin layer of ice. The apples then thaw and leak out like applesauce, leaving just the beautiful ice shell behind. The Catatumbo River in Venezuela might be the most electric place in the world, with nearly 300 storm days per year. The lightning storms are so consistent, they're predicted for three months in advance. During the wet season in October, 
you might see 30 lightning flashes in a single minute. A truly shocking experience. With each bolt having the energy to power a single light bulb for six months, the impressive display could power all of Venezuela forever. At sunset, strong winds flow around the three surrounding mountains, forming storm clouds over the water. As the water droplets of humid air collide with ice crystals from the cold air, it produces the static charges that cause the lightning storms nearly every night. If that wasn't bad enough, some storms have lightning above them as well. Try to take a picture of this one. Jellyfish lightning sprites are electrical discharges high in Earth's atmosphere. They're associated with powerful thunderstorms, but they have nothing to do with rain. These sprites occur 30 to 50 miles up in the sky, in the mesosphere. Artificial lights at night make it a lot harder to see this faint lightning. If you spot one, it'll look tiny, but can be well over 30 miles wide. The red sprites are a type of cold plasma discharge above a thundercloud. They're the balance of the lightning charges between the storm clouds and the ground below. Don't try to find this type of donut at your favorite bakery. It won't be there. Snow donuts are one of the rarest meteorological sites to see, with perfect weather conditions needed just to create them. Found in any snow-covered mountain area, like the Rocky Mountains, the wind, temperature, snow, ice, and moisture have to all work together for us to see these phenomenal rings. A thin layer of wet snow on the ground. Under that layer, ice or powdered snow. Then, a strong enough breeze to roll the donut down a hill, just like a snowball. Once it stops rolling, it can be the size of a baseball or as large as a car tire. It all depends on how strong the wind is. A newly formed snow donut won't stay around for very long, so hurry up with that camera! Watching the sunset over the horizon, the beautiful purples and pink overhead are nothing compared to the three suns you see in front of you. Wow, since when did Earth get three suns? These phantom stars sometimes appearing beside the sun are called sun dogs. Maybe they're called that because they're kind of dogging the actual sun? <laughs> sun dogs often appear as colored areas of light at the same height above the horizon as the sun. They're mostly observed on a ring or halo, where ice crystals best reflect the light. There are also moon dogs that appear alongside the moon and are formed by lunar light passing through ice crystals, though these aren't seen nearly as much as their daytime partners. Taking photos in the wild you finally found the perfect spot to take that dream shot. The crystal clear water, the pines, the mountains, and the flying saucer. Wait, a flying saucer? Oh, aliens are here! <clears throat> you might be thinking this if you saw a saucer-shaped cloud. I'm not even going to try to pronounce their name, though. Put that on the screen, please. Wait, just kidding. It's Alto Cumulus Lenticularis. Aren't you impressed? These are really just unusual cloud formations over mountaintops. When moist air flows over a mountain, a wave is created if the temperature difference is perfect. As the air passes through the wave, evaporation occurs and a series of these clouds may form into an oval shape. Not aliens at all. Whew. The sky is falling! The sky is falling! Well. People who have experienced these clouds say they look like they're coming down from the sky. Mammatus clouds look like giant white lumpy marshmallows, but it might be hard to toast these ones. These weird fluffy clouds can extend hundreds of miles in any direction, remaining visible for short periods at the bottom of anvil or other thunderstorm clouds. The strange bubble shapes are formed from turbulence within the storm itself creating an uneven cloud base and appearing anywhere in the world. Mammatus clouds form when moist air sinks into dry air. The air must be cooler than its surroundings, cooled with ice, or be heavy with water. Alert! Alert! Leave all your things behind and find safety immediately! The southern continent has just erupted! This is not a drill! 
You see people running around, screaming their heads out. Cars bumping into each other. The whole nation is in panic. You're on the southern coast of Australia, but the sky is black and it stretches further than your eye can see. Your friend in southern India calls you and says the same thing. There's ash in the sky and it's raining down on you. You hear rumbling in the distance and it isn't even your stomach to blame. Everyone starts running inland. The black clouds swallow up everything in sight. Cars, trees, buildings. You're unable to see anything in front of you. Everyone's confused and scared. A tsunami breaches the shores, covering everything in its path. This is the Great Antarctic Eruption. Antarctica is that big continental desert covered in ice. In fact, it's technically the largest desert in the world. It's also covered with a whole lot of volcanoes, just chilling around. Scientists discovered that there are 138 volcanoes in Antarctica, 91 of which are hidden beneath the icy surface, and 47 on top. And there might even be more. But most of these volcanoes are dormant. And for a volcano to be dormant, it has to be fast asleep for the last 50,000 years. The last volcano eruption was Mount Erebus in the western part of the continent. It's the most active volcano in the south side of the world and is roughly 12,500 feet above sea level. That's as high as stacking the Burj Khalifa on top of itself five times. There's a whole bunch of these volcanoes stretched across the entire continent. In the most concentrated region, the volcanoes spread the distance equivalent to that between Canada and Mexico. And that's not even all of them. Scientists have warned that if any of these interior ice-contained volcanoes were to erupt, they'd melt the western Antarctic part of the land and increase the spill of ice into the ocean. It would raise the sea level and flood many endangered lands that are already at risk. And that's not mentioning the tectonic plates shifting underneath the surface, which allows some of the magma to squeeze its way to some surfaces. It's scary enough to expect what would happen if a huge volcano erupted. But what would happen if all the volcanoes in the Antarctic continent erupted at the same time? If you were one of those scientists on a boat on their way to conduct some experiments, you would begin to feel unease. You'd notice the water carrying a bit more of the current than usual. You look at your fellow scientists, and they too have the same look on their faces. As you land at the shore and take out all your tools and equipment, things don't seem normal. But the work has to be done. You head to the base and settle in. Business as usual. In the barren land, you see some emperor penguins waddling around, hunting, playing, and doing penguin stuff. But as you look around, you notice that the penguins all suddenly head to the ocean, and many of the wild Antarctic birds also begin flying towards the horizon. Weird. Then the ground starts shaking, and behind you appears a tower of smoke reaching to the sky. The ashes from a volcano can be very harmful for anyone with lung conditions, and even healthy people. The gases that come with it are usually blown away quickly, but are also harmful to humans and cause irritation to the eyes and throat. But if you're nearby, you may need a gas mask, or better yet, evacuate! The gases and ashes are the most dangerous part of a volcanic eruption. Even though the lava spewing and explosion may seem scary, the smoke in the sky can spread far away and even halt planes flying around. You look to your fellow scientists and they signal to you that it's time to go. Make like the penguins and swim off. But the waters are extremely rough and the rumblings getting louder and louder. Suddenly, you see more smoke wafting towards the sky but from different locations. Back to the boat! It's sad to say, but leaving all that equipment was needed to survive. Carrying all that stuff would have slowed you down, but you're safe, for now. Looking behind you, you see a dark smoke screen covering every corner of the continent. Volcanoes have different types of eruptions. It's not just the shooting out lava into the sky scenario. They can range from aggressive to calm. Some spew out lava and some don't. This all depends on the environment, the number of gases contained, or if there's any groundwater present, and even the chemistry of the magma. So, chances are you'd be seeing all various types of explosions around you. You're out of Antarctica's mainland, 
but it's surrounded by lagoons and giant ice caps all around. You're doing your best to maneuver around them. But the ash is falling down all around. The sky is dark as the smoke blocks out the sun. Volcanic ash comes in all sizes and can cause different damage, from as little as lung and eye irritation to smothering vegetation and crops. And that's just the thing. More often than not, these volcanic ashes are extremely thick. They can even collapse the roofing of some buildings if a lot of ash is accumulated. Not to mention blocking roads and compromising aquatic life. And that flash in the sky isn't your imagination. Ash clouds in the sky are so powerful that they create electrical fields that can create lightning storms. And these bad boys can interfere with radio signals and even start fires. Also, these clouds are extremely hot on their own. As if that lava flow isn't enough to start any fires. Oh well. But there are some volcanoes that are explosive. And along with the ashes flying around, there are flying rocks. This overheated rubble comes striking down like meteoroids from the sky and can be pretty dangerous. You see the rocks hit the surrounding ice caps and water around you. As you reach a somewhat safe zone, you see the volcanoes all nicely lined up behind you, spewing all that thick red gooey fire. But the water tide isn't exactly peaceful. Volcanoes near oceans and seas can even cause tsunamis. Great! Submarine earthquakes shake the ocean bottom and produce large, powerful waves. And don't even think about surfing on them. If there are volcanoes spitting out red-hot lava, then why hasn't all the ice in Antarctica melted? The answer lies beneath the Earth's surface. Tectonic plates barely move underneath there. It's pretty safe to say they're stable. So for such a large piece of land, the coldest continent on Earth, the few active volcanoes are insufficient to melt all the ice. The real reason why the ice is melting and water levels are rising is the warm ocean current around Antarctica. But this time, they're all erupting at the same time. With the volcanoes discovered, who knows how many are left underground, covered in ice. And that's the scary part. Some of these volcanoes are hidden so deep beneath the icy surface that they now heat up from the lava spewing out. The ice begins to destabilize everything around. The ice on the ridges begins cracking open little by little. Like giant cans of soda bursting open, lava shoots from the snowy depths, causing enormous cracks in the ground. And then, magma finds its way to the party. This uninvited guest will begin to melt the surroundings, causing the ground to destabilize even more. Slowly but surely, the ice around Antarctica will melt. And if all the ice is melted, the Earth's sea level would rise by around 230 feet. That means coastal cities would be submerged underwater. The ocean currents would be flipped around, and hurricanes and typhoons would not want to take a break. Marine life would be in danger, and many small islands would completely disappear. And not to mention the smoke in the air that would travel around the world, halting many flights in the southern region. And if the winds were strong enough, the whole world. The economies would flop, and a worldwide panic would begin. Health emergencies all year round. Yeah, a real nice picture. When we think of active volcanoes, one region comes to mind. The Ring of Fire in the Pacific Ocean. Three quarters of Earth's volcanoes sit within this belt. Compare the area to Australia, which doesn't have any volcanic activity. The old continent of Europe is also calm. Or at least, we like to think so. Can you guess what the most active volcano in Europe is? If you thought of Mount Etna on the island of Sicily in Italy, you were right. The volcano has erupted about 200 times and has been far from sleeping in recent decades. The last time this happened was in August 2023. The highest mountain in the Mediterranean is half a billion years old. But in Iceland, there is a much younger volcano. It sprang into action on the 10th of July, 2023. In the afternoon, three fissures appeared in the ground on a peninsula in the southwest of the island. This was at a base of a small mountain peak. Its name means Little Ram in the local language. The volcano spewed molten lava high into the air. There were also gas plumes in the area. But the scientific community wasn't surprised by the event. They already knew about the volcanic area that stretches between the cities of Reykjavik and Keflavik. 
Its name is hard to pronounce. Hey, I want to buy a vowel. It had already erupted during the previous two summers. This activity came after eight centuries of dormancy. In the days leading up to the latest eruption, seismologists, the scientists who study earthquakes, recorded over 12,000 tremors. When the ground opened up in July, the fissures were over a mile and a half long. The following morning, two of them closed. All the lava was now coming out of the last fissure. It grew into an elongated cone, the simplest shape of volcano we are all familiar with. The lava soon filled a large crater. It grew almost 100 feet tall during the first week, and it is still growing. On the night when the eruption started, lava spread out in all directions. Its cinders set ablaze the dry moss in the vicinity. Local authorities closed off the surrounding area. There were toxic gases from the volcanoes and smoke from the burning moss. Firefighters flocked to the area. After a week, they proclaimed the area safe. Visitors soon came to witness the birth of Europe's youngest volcano. This form of tourism is quite developed in Iceland. People come from all over the world to watch active volcanoes. The land of fire and ice is home to more than 130 volcanoes. Some 30 of them are active. Now, I know what you're thinking right now. Is volcano tourism safe? In Iceland, it is. The country's authorities research and constantly monitor all of the hotspots. The island is dotted with several dozen seismic stations. These help researchers accurately predict future eruptions. And emergency services are accustomed to these sorts of events. They can quickly cordon off danger zones. This is what happened in 2010. A volcano in the south of the island, the name of which everyone struggled to pronounce, erupted. It spewed out a plume of steam and ash that was 7 miles high. Uh, this wasn't a fun time to be an air traveler. Winds carried the enormous plume southeast toward northern Europe. Many countries closed their airspace for several days for safety reasons. The volcano erupted in March, but the Earth was shaking from January the same year. So seismologists knew that an eruption was approaching. When it comes to the continent's youngest volcano, the tourist infrastructure is already there. Visitors can leave their cars at a designated parking lot. Then they go on a five-hour-long trek. This leads to a viewing deck. Tourists are so close to the epicenter that they can feel the heat haze from the crater. The site is the most impressive at nighttime. Safety is never a concern. Scientists regularly chart out hazard maps that outline the borders of lava fields. This way, visitors who stick by the rules are never in harm's way. More than a week after the eruption started, a section of the crater collapsed. Lava flowed downhill west of the volcano. This majestic smoldering hot river is slow-moving lava. Scientists categorize it as an a-a type. The term is Hawaiian. It describes basaltic lava that has a rough and brittle surface. The flow is composed of broken lava blocks that are called clinkers. They fall off as the substance flows. This reveals red-hot areas. The cooler sections of lava are gray and black in color. When it moves forward, it produces a distinctive sound like shattering glass. Nearly a month after the eruption of the new volcano, we got aerial footage of an interesting phenomenon. A tornado formed directly over the lava flow. This occurs due to the high temperatures in the area. When the conditions are right, a column of heated air can easily turn into a mini-tornado. Scientists observed a similar event happen during the 2018 eruption of Mount Kilauea in Hawaii. The lava fields of Europe's second-largest island tell the story of the creation of Iceland. It sits above the place where the North American and Eurasian plates meet each other. Tectonic plates are huge, rocky chunks of Earth's most outer layer. There are roughly 20 of them. They rest on a partially molten layer of rock. All the lava we see on the surface starts its journey here. You could say that these plates float on molten rock. Their boundaries are unstable. So when two plates grind past each other, they release tremendous amounts of energy. The formation of volcanoes is one result. These are places where the molten rock travels upward to the surface. Iceland began to form some 60 million years ago. The tectonic plates under the ocean drifted apart. 
enough lava piled up on the surface to create solid ground. This ancient rock is under the waves today. As new lava reaches the surface and cools down, it pushes the old rock away from the center of the island. That's why the oldest parts of Iceland aren't 60, but only 16 million years old. The country's active lava fields are young in geological terms. Some of them are under 1,000 years old. Scientists consider the island a hot spot for volcanoes, pun intended. Nearly a third of the basaltic lava that reaches the Earth's surface in recorded history came from Icelandic eruptions. Fisher swarms, like the ones before the 2023 eruption, cover 30% of the Nordic country. For this reason, only a quarter of the island is inhabited. Norse Vikings were the first people to settle in Iceland at the beginning of the 10th century. Nature threw them a loud welcoming party. Just a few years after their arrival, they witnessed one of the greatest volcanic eruptions in history. Vikings came from a region without volcanoes, so they had no clue as to what was going on. Today, Icelanders are used to such events. This is good because their homeland is entering a new era of volcanic activity. Volcanologists suspect that recent events are an introduction to decades of more frequent eruptions. The peninsula that is home to Earth's youngest volcano is just 17 miles southwest of Iceland's capital city. It's been dormant for a long time. Present-day eruptions there are a reminder that the natural processes that created Iceland are still ongoing. Recently, scientists discovered that there's a historical link between volcanic eruptions in the north of Europe and glaciers. Our planet went through at least five major ice ages. These were exceptionally lengthy periods when the average temperature on Earth dropped. The result was the expansion of ice sheets across northern Europe and North America. The last ice age ended some 10,000 years ago. Researchers are still trying to fully understand how these glacial periods affected volcanic activity. They suspect that the sheer weight of all that ice disrupts the flow of magma underground. When glaciers retreat, the pressure is lifted. This makes it easier for lava to flow upward to the surface where it bursts. Okay, watch your step now! Millions of gallons of hot magma are gathering in one flow and rising thousands of miles to the surface of our planet. A massive fracture in a tectonic plate shakes the ground and fills the air with a loud hum. Fire, gases, lava erupt from the dark, unexplored depths of Earth's crust. A planetary-scale catastrophe has just happened, and no one's noticed it. Now imagine you're having fun on a luxury yacht somewhere in the southwestern Pacific Ocean, drinking cocktails and sunbathing. At this moment, one of the most powerful volcanic eruptions in the planet's history is happening right below you. But you don't feel anything. You don't even drop your glass. Yeah, you can hear a strange sound coming from the ocean depths. You see foaming water and pieces of pumice floating up to the surface. But it doesn't bother you much. So how did it happen that we missed such a powerful eruption in 2012? Why did scientists find out about it only a few years later? The answer is simple. Water. An eruption of an ordinary volcano is a huge disaster. There are incandescent liquid metals and molten rock containing almost the entire periodic table inside our planet. All of this soup is called magma, and it's constantly boiling inside the subsoil of our world. This hot substance is lighter than the surrounding crust, so it always rises. Fortunately, the planet's surface is strong enough and doesn't allow magma to splash out. But sometimes, this protection fails. The upper part of Earth is covered with connected parts, tectonic plates. These plates collide with each other and then move apart. Imagine a big moving mosaic puzzle where all its parts are tectonic plates. And when a small part of this puzzle gets separated from another, magma immediately comes up. These unstable fault sites with leaking magma are called volcanoes. And when they erupt, it gets hot. Lava flows out of the vent and burns all the vegetation around. This is accompanied by earthquakes and thick black smoke. If a volcano spits out magma too high, it falls back to the surface in the form of fire rain. But the worst thing here is ash. It's not that ash that's left in your grill after a good barbecue, no no. Volcanic ash consists of solid particles harmful to any organism. 
These particles are not burnt wood, but various chemical elements. Volcanic ash is sharp, dense, and tangible. It can block sunlight, cover and destroy all plants, settle in your lungs. If you get too close to an erupting volcano, well, you better have a fireproof suit, oxygen tanks, a gas mask, and an underground shelter. Then you might survive, but there's no guarantee. At the same time, if an eruption occurs underwater, you don't need to worry about it. Of course, if you're not a marine biologist studying coral reefs nearby, or if you don't travel past that area in a submarine. In that case, boy, you're in trouble. When an underwater volcano erupts, this shakes a colossal area, heats the water, destroys the seabed. But almost nothing happens at the surface. The enormous pressure of millions of gallons of water suppresses the destructive power of the volcano. Molten rocks shooting out of Earth's crust get pressed against the seabed. Yeah, a submarine swimming by would be thrown off course and might collide with solidified lava. Fortunately, no such cases have ever been recorded, but it can easily become a reality because underwater eruptions happen pretty often. More than 70% of all volcanic activity occurs underwater, and almost no one notices it. In most cases, these volcanoes immediately fall asleep after they erupt and never wake up again. But in 2012, something happened, and scientists couldn't ignore it. Big pieces of pumice the size of a van began floating up in the southeastern Pacific Ocean. These rocks covered about 154 square miles. There were thousands of them. They looked like a group of unknown floating mini-islands. Volcanic stones were scattered in the ocean over the area twice as large as New Zealand. Scientists determined the full scale of the disaster with the help of deep-sea sonar devices. They studied the seabed at a depth of 4,000 feet for a long time and found 14 craters from which magma had flowed during the eruption. The seabed was covered with frozen lava flows and tons of ash. The researchers found that more than a third of the erupted volcanic material surfaced and was scattered all over the place. The rest remained at the bottom. This wiped out all marine life in the area. It seemed that this eruption was one of the largest in the entire history of observations. But in 2019, researchers discovered something even more significant. That was an underwater volcano three times higher than the Eiffel Tower. According to scientists' calculations, it ejected between 30 and 1,000 times more molten rock than the previous volcano. This monster had been feeding from the world's deepest magma reservoir we know about. Seismic activity here was so devastating that it destroyed everything around. Fortunately, not for long. After any eruption, life reappears like a phoenix rises from the ashes. And it's not just a figure of speech. Volcanic ash and lava around the volcano contain many useful mineral elements. All of them nourish the soil and help microorganisms develop on land and in the water. For this reason, there's usually so much vegetation, flowers, and trees around volcanoes. And underwater volcanoes can eventually form islands. This is a long process that ends with the appearance of a massive piece of land above the water surface. To understand how this happens, you need to go back millions of years. So, let's go! See this underwater volcano? There are sea dinosaurs, giant sharks, and ancient fish swimming around. Now the seabed starts shaking. The volcano releases tons of magma and ash. The water pressure immediately pushes all this stuff back to the bottom. The eruption can continue for a long time. The released magma raises the seabed. After hundreds, maybe a thousand years, a new eruption begins. New magma flows create a new layer above the previous one. Over millions of years, layer by layer, the volcano is growing. It's slowly rising, thanks to constant eruptions. Of course, with time, some volcanoes go dormant. But this one continues to erupt. And then, one day, the volcanic rock reaches the surface and an island emerges. After many more years, the volcano can fall asleep. After this, life is likely to appear on the island. Grass, flowers, trees, animals… The area that was once ruined seabed is swarming with life now. Volcanic islands have unique ecosystems because they develop separately from all the continents. Observing such islands helps scientists understand how life on Earth evolves. New species of birds, animals, insects can live on these chunks of land. Hundreds of islands around the world appeared thanks to eruptions of underwater volcanoes. You can find them in Hawaii, Indonesia, Iceland. Many of them are inhabited by people who build villages and towns there. 
There were cases when a volcano erupted when people literally lived on top of it. That's what happened on the small island of Aogashima, located to the south of Tokyo. People built a beautiful town right in the crater of an active volcano. And in May 1785, an eruption began. Nobody expected this to happen. At some point, thousands of birds rose in the air and flew away from the island. Then the ground began to shake. A heavy, low sound shook the air. Thick smoke appeared above the top of the green volcano. The crater started spitting dirt, huge rocks, and red-hot pieces of magma into the sky. The disaster lasted several weeks. People somehow managed to evacuate. Then, finally, the volcano calmed down. After that, a long process of recovery started. The inhabitants of the town rebuilt houses, roads, infrastructure. More than 200 years have passed since that moment. And during this time, the volcano never woke up. And despite the risk of a new eruption, people continue living there. The population is growing. Many people from other cities and countries come to live there. The main reason everyone loves this place is that it looks like a paradise. Nobody wants to leave the island. There are thermal springs where you can bathe, dense jungle with many beautiful animals and trees. The soil is rich, and you can grow tasty fruit and vegetables there. The water near the coast is swarming with fish. Every day, you can enjoy the incredible landscapes of the island. Seismological services constantly monitor the situation and watch the volcano's activity, listening for a rumble that may someday come again. Massive tsunamis, destructive tornadoes, giant meteorites, devastating earthquakes. Ooh, better have insurance. But all these are minor natural disasters compared with the eruption of a volcano. Some volcanoes can destroy a city, as it was with Pompeii, or some islands in the Pacific Ocean. But there's a dangerous type of eruption that can destroy all life on the planet. This type is called flood basalt. But first of all, let's figure out what a volcano is. Rivers of hot liquid metals and incandescent rocks flow deep inside our planet. And the deeper it gets, the hotter they are. The source of this hot mass is the mantle, which is the middle layer of Earth, located between the core and the crust. These fiery streams are called magma, and it flows everywhere. But we don't feel its heat because of the thick layer of our planet's crust. Magma is lighter than the crust, so it always tries to break out to the surface. And in some places, it succeeds. At the junctions of tectonic plates, it splashes out when one plate moves under a thicker one. When magma reaches the surface, it becomes lava. This substance burns the ground around and cools down quickly. It hardens and forms a new layer of rock. The following splash of magma falls on the top of this layer. Thus, a mountain appears layer by layer over millions of years. And in its mouth, a fault of tectonic plates splashes out magma. This mountain is called a volcano. It spits lava and ash into the sky, then falls asleep and wakes up again during seismic activity. Now imagine that several giant volcanoes begin to splash out an infinite amount of magma. It just doesn't end and covers an entire continent. This is a flood basalt. And one day, it did happen. About 252 million years ago, in the northern part of our planet, a lot of magma accumulated under Earth's crust. Trillions of tons of hot rock were concentrated in one place on a gigantic territory. And gradually, all this fiery energy began to seep out of the ground. Hot gas started to come out in different places in this territory. The ground shook endlessly, and the crust rose hundreds of feet all pointing to the approach of an imminent catastrophe. And then, at some point, magma began to pour out. Giant fountains of fire burst out of the ground. Do you know these geysers in Iceland? So imagine the same things, but dozens of times higher and with hot lava and ash instead of water and steam. The ash and lava flows were so strong that they reached the clouds. Under Earth's crust, there was a gigantic bubble of magma, and it squeezed out fiery jets under the pressure of rock and ground. The rift was getting bigger. Magma was flowing out everywhere. It began to fill the entire North continent. The flood of lava spread wider and wider. The streams of molten rock seemed endless. Layers of molten basalt rock overlapped one another, forming a giant tsunami of lava 160 feet high. 
it poured out of the ground for hundreds of thousands of years, flooding forests, rivers, lakes, and meadows. At the same time, billions of tons of volcanic ash rose into the sky, which could lead to a volcanic winter, since sulfur dioxide in the ash reflected the sun's rays. This might have lowered the temperature on the continent by several degrees. Then, dust and ash probably condensed and formed giant clouds that watered the surface with toxic acid rain. But after that, the cold lava formed a giant thick shield, preventing magma from seeping out of the endless fire bubble. The global catastrophe was over, but only for a short time. Trillions of tons of magma were still flowing under a thick layer of solid basalt. The fiery rivers couldn't reach the top, so they spread out to the sides. As a result of this expansion, huge nets were formed under the thick rock. They ran in different directions like a spider web and heated Earth's crust. Gases started coming out from under the surface again. More and more energy accumulated there, until an explosion of unimaginable force occurred. In addition to magma, carbon dioxide and ash escaped to the surface. They filled the atmosphere and caused the greenhouse effect. The temperature on the whole planet increased by several degrees. This release provoked another catastrophe that began in the ocean. There were deposits of methane, an explosive gas, on the seabed. Under ice-cold water, the methane was frozen and harmless. But the greenhouse effect in the atmosphere warmed up the entire ocean. Millions of tons of methane began to rise to the surface. This gas is more potent than carbon dioxide. Therefore, when it hit the atmosphere, the temperatures on Earth increased again. The whole globe turned into a hot sauna. In previous cool and humid places, the temperature reached those of a modern Sahara. Of course, most animals and insects couldn't survive such a cataclysm. But ocean life took much more damage. The heat and methane reduced the amount of oxygen in the ocean. Fish and other marine life couldn't survive in such conditions. New problems appeared when anaerobic bacteria started to multiply in non-oxygen water. They fed on methane and carbon dioxide and released hydrogen sulfide, a toxic substance that poisoned water even more. About 75% of land animals and 95% of the ocean's inhabitants went extinct. This flood basalt eruption was the only disaster in the planet's history that destroyed almost all plants and significantly reduced the insect population. Several species of the hardiest animals managed to survive in these conditions. The planet took about 10 million years to recover completely. After that, evolution began a new process of developing life. And here are two pieces of news. The bad one is that flood basalt will happen again and will be no less devastating than 252 million years ago. The good news is that it will happen in hundreds of millions of years. But when that happens, humanity will need to be prepared. It will start on the ocean floor. First, lava fountains miles high will begin boiling the water and emit sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere, where it will reflect sunlight. Along with ash and magma, a massive amount of water vapor will rise into the air. Livestock won't survive, and people will have breathing problems. Acid rain and increased humidity caused by the evaporation of the oceans will lead to the corrosion of buildings. All flights will be canceled. People will have to wear gas masks. Many animals won't be able to handle this eruption, but humans will adapt quickly. But then another and another eruption will follow, and this endless catastrophe will soon deplete the resources of humanity. Plants and trees won't recover so fast, and oxygen production will be significantly reduced. Let's hope that humanity will have colonized other planets, including those outside the solar system by that time. And now, let's jump back to the present. Ah. About 70% of the seismic activity associated with volcanoes occurs underwater. So let's see how ordinary volcanoes on the ocean floor work. Water, as well as land, rests on tectonic plates. Therefore, if their structure is broken at the joints, magma seeps through them. But unlike terrestrial volcanoes, lava here doesn't spread in different directions, burning everything it meets. It solidifies under the pressure of cold water. Underwater volcanoes can erupt for a long time with breaks in between. Magma covers the seabed. After another hundred or thousand years, 
a new eruption begins, and a new layer of rock forms over the previous one. Over millions of years, layer by layer, magma is rising. And then, one day, a volcano rises out of the water. Magma splashes out of it and increases its height. And now, we have a large volcanic island. Then, the volcano falls asleep, and life appears on the newly formed piece of land. Magma flows from the planet's mantle, filled with various chemical elements. This hot mix saturates the soil with useful substances and thus promotes the growth of plants and trees. Then birds and other animals arrive there, and the volcanic island turns into a paradise. Then humans arrive and pave over paradise to put up a parking lot and a franchise burger joint. This is not some hypothetical situation or fairy tale. The Vesuvius supervolcano that erased the city of Pompeii may wake up again and destroy many other towns built near the mountain. And to understand what consequences humanity would face if it wakens this time, it's smart to know what the eruption did 2,000 years ago with the ancient city. So Pompeii was a thriving city in the Roman Empire, located just 5 miles from Vesuvius on the west coast of Italy. It was a resort where the noblest and richest people rested. They walked along cozy streets, lived in beautiful villas, and had fun beside fountains. The soil in this region was fertile since the ground around the volcano had a lot of useful elements. Olives and grapes from Pompeii were sold throughout the empire. About 12,000 people lived in Pompeii by the time of the eruption. It seems not so much compared to modern standards, but it was considered a big city in those days. The catastrophe began unexpectedly in 79 CE. At first, everyone felt the ground tremble. Birds flew away from the volcano as far as possible. There was tension in the air because of the impending catastrophe. The volcano started to release thick smoke, soot, and ash. There was so much of it that soon it obscured the sky over the city with a heavy gray cloud. Vesuvius spat out gases, rocks, and dirt. Hot ash polluted the air and made it difficult for people to breathe. Locals couldn't see inside this gray haze. And then it started raining heavily. The water mixed with ash and soot and fell on Pompeii. Roofs of houses broke under the heavy weight of mud. Streets, fountains, alleys, and squares were hidden under millions of tons of soot. The next day, the destruction continued with renewed force. There was an explosion of hot gas and crushed rock at the top of the mountain. A devastating blast wave at a speed of 100 miles per hour dispersed in all directions and vaporized all the trees in its path. When the wave reached Pompeii, it turned the city into ruins. On the second day, the eruption stopped. By this time, the great town had been lying under a thick blanket of ash. By the way, this type of eruption is called an explosive one. But when lava flows out of a volcano and causes a fire, this is a quiet eruption. The last time Vesuvius erupted was in 1944. But even today, it's still one of the most dangerous volcanoes in the world. But nobody's afraid of it. Three million people live around the mountain, about 20 miles from the crater. If the volcano wakes up, it could be one of the most enormous cataclysms in the modern world. Pompeii was destroyed almost 2,000 years ago. Since then, science and technology have advanced a lot. We're planning to colonize Mars someday. We've created a metaverse. But so far, we're still powerless before the forces of nature. An erupting supervolcano can destroy nature around it and cause technogenic catastrophes in big cities. The phone lines would be overloaded and people wouldn't be able to call their loved ones or the rescue services. There would be big traffic jams on the roads. Panic would spread throughout the streets. Fires would start because of falling hot soot. All flights would be canceled and locals would have to hide in airports, supermarkets, and the subway. A large gray cloud would obscure the sun and make the air hot. 
The only thing that can help us in such a situation is a preliminary warning about the upcoming eruption and good preparation. So if the disaster starts while walking on the streets, you should take shelter in a car or building. It's better to buy a dust mask in advance that allows you to breathe freely. If there's no mask, cover your nose and mouth with any cloth. If you stay at home, close all doors and windows so volcanic ash can't get into your apartment or home. These incandescent particles can easily set fire to a carpet or curtains. Put wet towels under the door sills. If you need to go outside for some reason, wear a suit covering your body completely. Don't forget about the protection for your eyes. Put on special glasses that have a dustproof function. And remember about the mask. If you have a house, you need to disconnect the downpipes from the gutters to avoid clogging the drains. If your house has a rainwater collection system, you need to disconnect the pipes from the tank. Rain with ashes is a hot, dense mess that can easily break the water supply system. Fill the tub and sink to have water for washing and cleaning in case the central water supply is turned off. Set the lowest temperature on the fridge and freezer. Your food will be stored much longer if electricity is shut down in the city. Go to a room without windows above ground level and wait for a message from authorities on the radio or TV. Keep the receiver close to you so you don't miss anything important. The device must have a full charge, a strong body, and a powerful antenna. Here's an excellent option for survival in the ash apocalypse. The eruption is intensifying, and you hear on the radio about the evacuation. At this point, you need to calm down and follow the instructions from rescuers. Collect a bag at home with food, water, and medical supplies. Your emergency kit should include flares, maps, a first aid kit, sleeping bags, flashlights, a fire extinguisher, a portable phone charger, car tools, and a few charged batteries. You should always have a filled gasoline canister if you live near an active volcano. Going to the gas station is not a good idea during the evacuation. You can get into a long traffic jam and spend too much time in it. If you don't have a car, ask your friends for help or pay someone for a ride. It's possible the city administration would organize buses for evacuation. You would find out about it through the radio. In any case, before leaving the house, don't forget to turn off the gas and electrical devices and shut off the valve with the water supply to prevent your home from a gas leak or flooding. Government officials. So, you're driving a car. The authorities must announce the plans for evacuation. Don't go off the route because some roads can be blocked. Perhaps they will say the eruption is over and you can return home. Maybe the eruption will be so strong that it will destroy the city. Anyway, if you're prepared, you'll have fewer things to worry about. Modern seismic sensors monitor the fluctuations of tectonic plates and the volcano's activity. So the eruption won't be a surprise. Pompeii is far from the only city destroyed by the eruption. In 1785, a similar disaster occurred in the Japanese town of Aogashima. It was located right in the crater of an active volcano, and one day it woke up. It was sunny weather, and no one suspected a disaster was coming. At some point, the birds rose in the air and flew away. Then the ground began to shake. A heavy low sound came from the depths of the island, and thick streams of smoke and ash erupted from the volcano. The volcano threw dirt and big red-hot stones into the sky. It looked like a meteor shower. People evacuated, and the mountain continued to erupt for several weeks. When the ashes settled, the volcano fell asleep again, and people began to return to their city. Despite the risk of a new eruption, they continue to live and work there today. Since then, more than 200 years have passed, and the volcano never woke up. Meteorological and seismological services monitor the situation and seismic activity. After all the horrors and devastation that a volcanic eruption leads to, harmony in nature eventually comes. Decades and centuries later, 
Volcanic ash, rich in helpful food elements, settles on the soil and makes it fertile. Then, life will rise from the ashes like a phoenix.